I would like very much, if it's okay with you, to read a couple of paragraphs from a letter I read that was um, written by Roger Ebert. Would that be all right? Yes. Um, I think they're very beautiful. Um, he's skipping through here. This was um, a letter written to you um, by Roger Ebert, November 17, 2007. I have to uh, say one thing beforehand. Uh, the film Encounters at the End of the World is dedicated to Roger Ebert. And as whom I love as a, as, as a wonderful warrior, a soldier, a good soldier of cinema. And I, I said to him, uh, Roger, uh, this dedication uh, will prevent you from reviewing the film. You cannot do this anymore. <laughs> So he decided to send me a letter, which he did. And I kept, I kept it completely secret, but Roger eventually uh, published it on his website. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a very beautiful letter, so I, I'm, I'm glad he did. And, and that's where I discovered it. Um, incidentally, I, I mentioned it briefly when we uh, met each other earlier tonight, but I really feel compelled to say it again. I saw your new film, Encounters at the End of the World, last night on the big screen uh, up at the Jacob Burns Film Center. And, and it's such a thrill to be seated here with you because you've made another, yet another brilliant masterpiece. Congratulations. It's so extraordinary. Um, amazing film. Amazing, of course, which is what we've basically come to expect from you at this stage of the game. Um, <laughs> leaping forward, uh, uh, he says, Dear Werner, without ever making a movie for solely commercial reasons, without ever having a dependable source of financing, without the attention of the studios and the oligarchies that decide what may be filmed and shown, you have directed at least 55 films or television productions, and we will not count the operas. You have worked all the time because you have depended on your imagination instead of budgets, stars, or publicity campaigns. You have had the visions and made the films and trusted people to find them, and they have. It is safe to say you are as admired and venerated as any filmmaker alive, among those who have heard of you, of course. Those who do not know your work and the work of your comrades in the independent film world are missing experiences that might shake and inspire them. You often say this modern world is starving for images, that the media pound the same paltry ideas into our heads time and again, and that we need to see around the edges or over the top. When you open Encounters at the End of the World by following a marine biologist under the ice flows of the South Pole and listening to the alien sounds of the creatures who thrive there, you show me a place on my planet I did not know about, and I am richer. You are the most curious of men. You are like the storytellers of old, returning from far lands with spellbinding tales. In the process of compiling your life's work, you have never lost your sense of humor. Your narrations are central to the appeal of your documentaries, and your wonder at human nature is central to your fiction. In one scene, you can foresee the end of life on Earth, and in another, show us country musicians picking their guitars and banjos on the roof of a hut at the South Pole. You did not go to Antarctica, you assure us at the outset, to film cute penguins. But you did film one cute penguin, a penguin that was disoriented and was steadfastly walking in precisely the wrong direction into an ice vastness the size of Texas. Quote, and if you turn him around in the right direction, you say, he will turn himself around and keep going in the wrong direction until he starves and dies. The sight of that penguin waddling optimistically towards his doom would be heartbreaking, except that he is so sure he is correct. But I have started to wander off like the penguin, my friend. I have started out to praise your work and have ended by describing it. Maybe it is the same thing. You and your work are unique and invaluable, and you ennoble the cinema when so many debase it. You have the audacity to believe that if you make a film about anything that interests you, it will interest us as well. And you have proven it. With admiration, Roger. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah.
Well, I, I salute him, the good soldier of cinema. We have very few left. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because with, with fewer and fewer mm -hmm. uh, film critics, um, uh, obviously there's less and less interesting discussion of film, yeah. uh, a, a drastically abbreviated dis diversity of opinion. And um, it's, it's, it's too bad, uh, thinking back to a time when there were more interesting ideas, uh, perspectives yeah. around. Um, Roger Ebert has always been an extraordinary film critic. And just recently, with, with his health struggles, he's yeah. come to reveal himself as just as a great, extraordinary just human yeah. being, hasn't he? Well, he's soldiering on, uh, despite his affliction. He has uh, battled cancer for more than two years. Um, and because of uh, some very major surgery around his neck, he cannot speak anymore. So he would communicate uh, by, by smiling at you and writing little notes on a pad. And uh, that's the way I, I, I communicate with him. And this is the reason why he, uh, of course, he couldn't write a, re a review of, uh, of the film. Uh, you don't do that when it's um, uh, dedicated to you. For me, it's very moving uh, having received this letter, and I never expected he would publish it. I would never have published it. Um, those things uh, should stay among two men, but he chose to, to have it published, uh, and I thank him for it, and he has been very kind to my films and to my work. Well, I think that it's, uh, it's safe to say that, that we, myself certainly not, I don't know how many people here would, uh, would not characterize a, a sense of your films in such a poetic way, but certainly yeah. I thought uh, it, it really sums up a, a, a great yeah. way of viewing your body of work. Um, the, um, in Aguirre, here's a question I've wanted yes. to ask you okay, yeah. ever since I saw the film every night uh, when it opened in Los Angeles where I was living at the time and saw it. The, um, the, uh, has most everybody seen Aguirre? Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so here is this amazing film, and it begins, and there's a trek through the jungle, and then the, the party arrives at the river. And now we see a sustained, fairly wide shot of the water. And maybe the music of Popol Vuh is on yeah. the soundtrack, creating this amazing marriage, which is so emblematic of all your work, of, of, of sound and image, music and image. And this shot keeps lasting, and it's wonderful. Yeah. And then, extraordinarily, I think the film cuts to a tighter shot of the water. Yes, Which does. then plays and plays and plays. Why did you do that? What led you to that moment? Um, I have a theory. It's, it's very hard to verbalize this, but uh, I was very fascinated by these raging waters of Urubamba River. It's just right down below Machu Picchu. And um, I filmed it, and I, I asked the cinematographer, hold the shot, hold the shot. This is so, so violent. This is so incredible. And, uh, and I knew I would use it in the film, which I did, out of any proportion. We are, you have the information of the river raging down there and boiling in rage. And yet, uh, uh, although we, we understand the image within two seconds, the shot is held more than a minute. For a while, I thought I would have opening credits over it, and then I decided, no, they must not be over this. I just hold it, and, and I prepare the, the audience for something out of proportion, for human beings that are completely crazed in, in their insane dreams of power. And it's, it's going to be something, a, a fever dream in the jungle, which is completely out of proportion. Many serious people who are working in the, in the industry tell me, ah, this is miscut and, and misedited. Uh, you hmm. should have made it much shorter. <laughs> and I said, no, I, I, I do it as it is, and, and it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, first I was trying to, uh, and I, I love that explanation, and at, at first I was trying to understand why this, this moment of cinema moved me so much and had such a, really within the context of watching films, such a profound impact on me and why I, I loved that it kept going on, even though I didn't exactly understand why that yeah. was. And I, I eventually moved from that 
I noticed that I started trying to hold shots longer and longer in my own work and never achieving this kind of magic. But I then moved to, to trying to figure out, well, why did the filmmaker, why did, why did Herzog do this? I kind of, my, my explanation is that because the, this group of humans arrives at this river upon which they will all meet their death. Yeah, yeah. So there's nothing more important yeah. uh, than this water and this river. And, and yeah. once upon it, Right. Yeah, but, but sometimes these things, there is something obvious that everyone notices, but very often things are very subtle and, and they cannot be really explained. Uh, uh, for example, when at the end it's, it's pure fever dreams and they see a, a brigantine in the, mm. in the treetop, mm. 30 meters, 90 feet high up there, <laughs> and no flood can have washed it that high. Mm. And then all of a sudden one of the uh, men on board receives an arrow that hits him in the in the leg, and he just looks at it and he says, uh, "Long arrows long... are coming back in fashion." Well, that's a, a, another moment. But <laughs> yes, a, a, a man gets shot with an arrow, and, yeah. it, and before they were shot by little darts right. from blow blowpipes. All of a sudden, one is shot by an arrow that is six feet long, and goes in and out on the other side. And he grabs the arrow calmly, and he looks along this shaft of the arrow, and he says, the long arrows are coming into fashion. Yes. <laughs> and, and then he dies. He falls over and is dead. So, but, but this subtle, strange moment uh, prepares you for, for the most inconceivable. It opens. All of a sudden, the audience is ready to accept the most inconceivable. And sometimes it's very, very subtle and very strange how, for example, um, there's a clear orientation of movement. Uh, you have the feeling, yes, they are moving towards El Dorado, but somehow, imperceptibly, uh, we lose orientation and they lose orientation. How this is done is very, very subtle and, and very well thought through. In the same, I, I keep wondering about your films, uh, how, how, for example, you establish very subtle, in, in very, very subtle way, uh, something that is, is complete and utter primal fear. I've never been scared so deeply, like, for example, in The Silence of the Lambs. Mm. I've never been scared as this, and you can't scare me easily. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't respond to that. <laughs> no, but, uh, well, I, I give the answer instead of you. We are <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. we, are, we are just professional men who know how to handle cinema. And, and we have learned it the hard way. Uh, through lots of defeats, and that's what made us into what we are. Hmm. I, I'm a result of defeats. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I loved Rescue Dawn. Uh, I had read, uh, I hope lots of people saw that one. Um, there was that article in New Yorker, yes. um, which you must have read at some point, have, and, it, yeah. and it sort of, I think the article, I devoured that article, and, and, and I wanted to enlist other yeah. filmmakers and, and, and Herzog fans to get on planes and go beat everybody up that was giving you a hard time. And I think that the writer really wanted to permeate the piece with a sense of doom for, for the film, that it was sort of destined somehow to, to fail, given the kind of obstacles yeah. that you were faced with. And um, I was so thrilled to, when I saw it to see... Um, uh, not only how you were able to make a Werner Herzog film um, in in what might arguably be considered a Hollywood formulaic basic yeah. situation, but that you were able to um, uh, deliver um, the best possible version of that formula, that you actually fulfilled all the requirements of the genre while still making the film tremendously personal, unique, and uh, I was really so impressed, and I, I was kind of horrified at, at how, how thin and emaciated Jeremy Davies was. 
Oh, and I, I, I wondered if you, is that something that, that you could talk about a little bit? Uh, yes. Uh, well, Jeremy Davis is is fairly thin uh, most of the time, but uh, <laughs> I, I kept wondering when he arrived. He hoisted a, a couple of very heavy overseas uh, trunks with him. And we found out it was all full with bottled Evian water, <laughs> which you could buy, which you could buy right next to the hotel in a little store. And uh, and I said, Jeremy, my God, what 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 is this? Yeah, he wanted to to feed himself only on water. Mm -hmm. And and I tried to persuade him to eat once in a while, which he eventually did. But uh, it's just amazing his dedication. And of course, when you are speaking about the witness, a journalist who was there from the New Yorker, very keen observer, what he did not figure out is he was there in the very early phase when things were not that bad yet. Uh, but he couldn't figure out that uh, I had to keep the film, like many others, out of all the, the turmoil and of, out of all the ugliness and maintain its integrity. And that was the hardest thing in, in uh, Rescue Dawn, and I'm proud that I was able to, to really maintain the integrity of the film. You certainly did, and the, the, um, uh, Steve Zahn, who I've always liked very, 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 very much, it was fantastic seeing him. It's such a, to me, it was an unlikely match in a way, because the kind of films that, that Steve has done thus far. Have... Yeah, he's known as, as a funny sidekick yeah. in Eddie Murphy movies. How, yeah. However, there are some very early films by with Steve Zahn in it, where he has a vulnerability and something. He, when when I see him, I always have the feeling it's some a, a man who should hug and protect and help him mm -hmm. along. And he, he he's wonderful in in his performance. And and I think it's a it's a great achievement of Steve uh, to uh, morph himself into this part and do something that nobody expected from him. Yeah, definitely. And, and by the way, Jeremy Davis is, is someone I've, I've noted him, I think he, in Solaris, I think, was yeah. the first time I noticed him. I thought, what a really splendid, uh, a different, stylistically very different American yeah. actor he was. Um, no, he's, a, he's a, a, a unique, very, very significant talent on screen anywhere in the world. There's yeah. very, very few actors of his caliber. And of course, uh, Christian Bale, I, I, I had the privilege to work with the best. And, yeah, and I, I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. Werner, you, you were born in Germany. Yeah. Um, in uh, Bavaria. In Bavaria. Yeah, which I would like to, okay, that, I'd like to make that distinction. That's a, no, I, fair like enough, a, is, that a Scot, is that Munich? A Scotsman, a Scotsman would not agree easily that he was British. I, I don't like the Germans. <laughs> so. um, <laughs> yeah. I was curious about, um, so was, was therefore, would, would, would your life growing up, uh, being a boy in Bavaria, be quite different from a boy who was living in, in, in Germany proper and, and what have you? And uh, yes, certainly, because I grew up uh, in a very inaccessible, very remote mountain valley in, in the Bavarian Alps. Actually, I was born in Munich, but uh, only uh, when I was only two weeks old, uh, bombs hit all around us, and uh, my mother found me under a thick layer of glass shards and, and uh, brick debris and other mm. things. So she got scared and grabbed my older brother and me and fled into the mountains. And that's where we got stuck. So I, I, I had a different life than other people in Bavaria or other people in Germany. Uh, all my peers grew up in ruins and they had a wonderful childhood because they possessed the entire city that was in ruins, no fathers around to tell them how to behave and what to do. So it was anarchy in the best sense of the word. And of course I grew up in, in some sort of anarchy and, and without any knowledge of the world outside. I only knew about the world uh, through fairy tales or so. And, and all of a sudden American soldiers occupied the small town of Sachrang 
and there was a black man, and I ran to my mother and I said to her, I saw a, a pitch black moor, because the pitch black moor is a part of a nursery rhyme. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I marveled at him and I immediately wanted to befriend him, and, and I sat at the slope of the mountain with him and talked to him. And he gave me a chewing gum, which I kept for a year, <laughs> chewing on it and hiding it away from my older brother. And my mother, my mother said, uh, you, you, you kept talking to him for three hours now. In which language uh, did you speak to him? I said, in American. So, and it was, mm. since then I, I marvel and I have the warmest feelings about, uh, about African Americans. What a wonderful warmth this man had, and the voice was incredible, and he loved me and gave me a chewing gum. <laughs> it's a, a fantastic... And, and of course, we had, to, we had no toys, we had no tools, we had to invent our own toys. And in a way, later, I had the feeling I was inventing cinema myself, because I had not seen films until I was 11. Mm. I didn't even know they existed. And I have to add, I do that often, but I have to add it for the fun of you. I made my first phone call when I was 17. So, but I made my first film when I was 19. Hmm. Um, and I, I was in a way in a situation where without much knowledge of cinema at all, I started to develop projects and I started to, to become a filmmaker. And I became a filmmaker a day I was thrown out again from an office of some producers who, who laughed at me because I was still very tiny. <clears throat> and I, I decided to become, uh, to make my own money and become my own producer. And I worked the night shift as a welder for the last two and a half years in, in high school. And of course, then I had money and I stole a camera and I bought some raw stock and I made films. Mm. And I'm still doing it somehow. Mm. <laughs> You, your pictures are so utterly unique. Um, uh, it's, it's impossible to perceive what any kind of influence an outsider might go, OK, now I'm going to look at these films of Werner Herzog, and I'm going to kind of figure out what influenced him. And it's impossible. Do you think, were you influenced by any films in particular? Or, or? Not really. No, I, I couldn't, couldn't really recall. Maybe Dr. Fu Manchu, where I discovered that they recycled one shot. 10 minutes later, and I was the only one who saw that. And uh -huh. I started to look with different eyes. But probably it's more music that uh, had a, a, a deep impact on what I'm doing, or literature. And uh, Encounters at the End of the World is, is very much influenced, uh, as strange as it may sound, by, by I, I read, uh, again, uh, Virgil's Georgics. I hated school uh, and I had to learn Latin and ancient Greek and dismissed it and now I'm glad that I did and I, I have gone back into reading uh, 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 writers of antiquity and in the Georgics of uh, Virgil it's so incredible how he describes agriculture and, and country life and, and the most amazing of all is he names the glory of the country, and he names the glory of the beehive, and he names the glory of the mm. plow going through the field, and, and the oxen moaning and, and, and grumbling. And, and he just names it. And, and I thought when I went down to Antarctica, no idea what, what I was going to find, no idea what I was going to do. And I, I took consolation in Virgil, and I said to myself, this is what I'm going to do. I name the glory of Antarctica in mm. my film, one after the other. Mm. And I name the glory of these wonderful men and women that I met down there. And, and this is why, at the end of the film, the, I, I used some music from um, Russian Orthodox church choirs. And there's a basso profundo, a bass voice mm. that is one uh, octave lower in pitch than a regular octave. And the voice, which was, is incredible, like a big column of voice, and it, it establishes the glory of one saint after the other. He just names saint after saint after saint after saint. 
and that's what I try to do in my movie. Is, it, is that the piece at the end of the that's film? A very, yeah, that's a very final piece. That's an extraordinary piece of music. Very, yeah. Yeah, very, very moving. And I had this piece of music before I started shooting. I knew it was going to be the end. Well, th this, that was, that's actually one of my questions, is finding music for your films. But, but I wanted to also say to you, because this, as always, the score of this film is amazing. And um, uh, the, the, is, did you choose this, uh, this beautiful um, uh, guitar playing because th th we have a sort of a, a pioneer-like association, a uh, frontier association with, with a certain kind of, of guitar music played a certain way? I always had the feeling that the other part of the music, a part of the sacrality of the Russian church choir, should be um, a great guitar player, uh, David Lindley. Oh my and, God, he's so yeah, amazing. And, and Henry Kaiser, to uh, whom I owe a lot, because he was the one who, uh, who filmed the underwater footage. He's a great expert diver, and, and he was, was never convinced that this was any good and That's wanted so to funny. throw it away. And I said, Henry, I've never seen anything as beautiful, and I'm very grateful that he worked on the film and we created mm. the music. And uh, mm. I'm very fast in, in knowing what, what sort of music I should have. In, in 20 seconds flat, I know this piece belongs to the end, and and this should be there, do, do you sometimes spend to the dismay of, of the editor who wants to try this and that sure. and the other, and they say, no, don't you hear, this is the only and perfect piece. Do you ever let the editor try something else and to your sometimes, amazement discover that you like yes. that even better? Sure, uh, and, it, and it happens once in a while that mm -hmm. music, in music case, very rarely. Uh, I'm so sure, and, and, and I, I think I do not make major mistakes there. <laughs> as far but, as we're concerned, course, you've made no mistakes. But of uh, course, uh, uh, cinematographers, editors, uh, musicians, they always uh, have their word in it, and, and I'm never surrounded by yes-men. Did David Lindley, um, who I have uh, been a fan of his, he had a, a, a band back in the late 60s called Kaleidoscope. And um, I still have these records. I still listen to his stuff. It's really, as you as you know, you know him. Therefore, you know he plays every stringed instrument and yeah. probably others. <clears throat> Did he um, do that music to picture? Um, he saw the picture, but he didn't do it to picture. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to slavishly follow some rhythm. He understood the basic rhythm of it, mm -hmm. and um, we talked about using of instruments. For example, he would use. Um, he would do an, an almost American-sounding tune, but played on a uh, on a Mid-Eastern instrument, an mm. oud. Mm, yeah, uh, and and I mean it's absolutely ingenious because all of a sudden there's a strangeness in it and a very subtle beauty in it that that you didn't expect. Yeah, bring the kind of um, implicit I, I love global to work with musicians. Yeah, it's nothing better than that. The uh, Henry Kaiser and, and the, the opening footage um, that you just described, I, I don't know if you've seen this with an audience, but you, and you guys will see this w when you see this film. Um, but it, 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 And it's happened with other Herzog films. I've, I, I've had this experience before. But, but this time I really noticed, and I felt it um, along with the audience, where suddenly you'll, see, you'll, you'll feel everyone in the audience going <laughs> and being drawn literally drawn to the screen because it's, for many reasons, the richness of what you're seeing is just incomparable. You don't see stuff like this anywhere. And um, it's so beautiful, and it, yeah. it, it, it changes your life a little bit. You know, you, you see things that, mm -hmm. that you're, you're just more experienced than you were before that shot came on. And I, I thought, um, I wrote, wrote it down here, so I want to get it right. Um, uh, yeah, I, I thought that if you had business cards, you know, and, and if you wanted Which to I hand them out. Never had, but anyway, well, yeah. Well, if you ever do, what you should, you know, you'd have your name and then it should say on it, previously unseen images, previously unheard sounds uh, and thoughts. Um, this, it's, it's a reinvention of the, of the whole visual vocabulary. And this guy, Henry Kaiser, must be quite an interesting cat. If he can come yeah. to you with that footage, then turn around and create music for the film. Well, he didn't come to me with the footage. He showed it to the editor out in the control room. I was sitting with the musicians when, Which we, control did, room? when we did uh, Grizzly Man with Richard <laughs> Thompson. And I always sit in physical contact with a musician. And he was out there. 
in, in the control room, separated by several uh, walls of glass. <laughs> and he turns around, and for a moment, I see something I have never seen before. And I stopped everyone, rushed out, and I said, <laughs> Henry, show me this again. I want to see this. And he said, oh, no, it's bad, and I didn't film it that well, and I was underwater. I didn't even know that he was a diver. And I said, I must have this footage, and I will do a science fiction film out of it, which sure. ended up in a film I did. It's called The Wild Blue Yonder. And so I owe him uh, the mm. backbone, the most wonderful footage for an entire film. And I met him years, years, years before, because I listened to recordings of uh, um, ethnic music all over the world, and mostly very old uh, recordings, for example, one in Madagascar recorded in 1931 is the end of Little Dieter Needs to Fly. Mm. And I, I see this, uh, um, uh, this series of recordings uh, and I thought, this is extraordinary, there must be some, someone very, very special behind it. And I kept asking around and somebody said to me, uh, uh, his name is Henry Kaiser, and I said, I must meet him. And I met him without any agenda, just to express to him how wonderful he had worked on this. And it turns out he's a musician himself, so we got to know each other. Mm. And of course, when, when we speak about the music in uh, uh, Encounters at the End of the World, he uh, not only knew very, very quickly what sort of music should be recorded, he also listened to this Basso Profundo church choir, and he kept feeding me with the most wonderful Russian Orthodox church music. Mm. He, he immediately grasped it, picked it up, and sent me, and kept feeding me. And I listened to it with uh, Joe Beanie, the editor, and I said, number six, that's the one that we need for the beginning. Mm. And we did. Fantastic. So I, sometimes... Sometimes I'm blessed that uh, men uh, who, with whom I do not normally have to deal uh, come like a gift uh, out of the sky and fall in my lap. And, and I, it's, it's like, like uh, golden coins raining on me. Mm. And by extension on us. Is, Bernard, the, 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 the subjects, the people you speak with, um, uh, who speak to the camera and speak to you, um, they're so relaxed, and they're speaking with a, a candor that it's hard to imagine arriving in a moment like that <clears throat> without a camera mm -hmm. rolling. Is the, do you have a little trick you do? How do you get people to... Well, somehow I know the heart of men, and that's why I <laughs> am a filmmaker. And there's a very f strange incident when I did... Uh, the wild blue yonder. Mm -hmm. I not only did I um, use Henry Kaiser's strange planet uh, material, I also uh, found images, uh, material shot on 16 millimeter celluloid, which that was done by astronauts back in 1989 mm. on one of the space shuttles of unspeakable beauty. Nobody so ever saw this footage, and I discovered it in an abandoned uh, NASA archive. And, and I wanted to meet the astronauts and film with them 16 years later. And I finally got them together and we met in Houston at the Johnson Space Center. And there were these five or six chairs for them, two, uh, two women and three men, five of them, and a chair for me. And I was introduced to them and I stood there and I didn't know what to say now. My heart somehow sank and I looked from face to face to face. And then I had some sort of a moment of, a glorious moment of intuition. And I said to them, I grew up as a boy, I grew up in Bavaria in the mountains, and I was looking after cows, and I'm, um, as a boy I learned how to milk cows. From that time on, I can tell from a face who is able to milk a cow. And I said, you, sir, you can milk the cows. Ah, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, 
<laughs> he, he truly looked like a man, like a good farm boy who, who, who knew how to milk a cow. And, and, and I, I did the right thing. And from that moment, the ice was broken. After three sentences, the ice was broken, and, and we were in business. Or, or, for example, in Encounters at the End of the World, I spoke very briefly to this um, uh, man, uh, David Pacheco, mm. uh, the journeyman plumber. Yeah. And he was kind of reluctant to, to even listen to me, and he had to go back to work right away. I met him five minutes. And then instead of shaking his hand, I turned to the side and showed my elbow. And he turns around and elbows me. And we were in business. <laughs> See? <laughs> or, for example, the, um, the man who uh, has studied these gigantic icebergs. An iceberg, he was on an iceberg that is larger uh, than the country that built the Titanic. Uh, larger than Northern Ireland, larger than Lebanon, the country of Lebanon. And I somehow, he caught my attention again in the, in the cafeteria. And I wanted to film with him, now he had to leave. And, and then I saw him again and I said, uh, can we do it now? And he said, no, no, no chance. In 35 minutes, my plane is leaving from mm -hmm. the ice runway. Mm -hmm. I had 35 minutes, so I said to him, uh, I, let's give it a try. Let's go wild, let's give it a try. So he sat down. I started to make an espresso for him. And we talked about Bavaria, and we talked about this and that. And I said to him, um, and then I had to silence the noisy Italian group that had just come back and drank Chianti and sang songs. It was just too loud for me as a sound man, mm -hmm. because I did sound. And then there was this uh, traffic of, of carts wheeled around outdoors, so I silenced the entire environment and left him alone for five minutes. So we had 12 minutes left. And I said to him, and, and, and I, I had the feeling he should be instructed in a, in a special way. And I said to him, I don't want to hear the scientist. We know roughly what you are doing. I want to hear the poet now. Mm. And he looked at me, and uh, then he nodded. And he said, he's uh, the real poet, how he speaks about it. Mm. So uh, yeah, sometimes it is, it is if, if I had rushed into doing an interview with him, it would have been insignificant, and I probably would have not used it mm -hmm. in the film. You, you, have to, you have to understand a situation, and you have to know the heart of men. If you don't, you are not a filmmaker. And you know, as a filmmaker, where the epicenter of all fear is. Mm. So if you don't, uh, don't make movies. <laughs> you recorded that you were the sound recordist on the film? Yes, you, sure. It you was took a that great team. responsibility? Two oh, I team. have done it before. I've done, cin uh, I've, uh, done cinematography in films and, and embarrassed as having myself too many times in credits. I asked some well-known cinematographers, can I borrow your name? So I <laughs> put them instead of me. So. But <laughs> uh, yes, I'm, I'm all right as a sound man, and I'm proud. But however, I have to say, the finest piece of sound was done by Douglas Quinn, a, a wonderful artist who uh, had also an artist and writer's grant, went down to Antarctica two or three years before me and recorded with un underwater microphones the strangest of all calls oh God, that of, scene of, is, of seals. And yeah, that listening yeah. scene is yeah. amazing. Of course, it was kind of staged because uh, uh, the scientists wouldn't listen like this with the ear on the ice. Actually, so the lady what? almost froze to, to, to really? the ice. <laughs> really? <with the> <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's this one with his fuzzy white beard, and I, I, I gave him exactly the kind of position how he should look. So it's, it's, it's very precisely staged, but it's very moving, and it's just wonderful. It's, how, it's a how great you hear, scene. Yeah, and only because they are listening with this incredible intensity, we as an audience start to listen to it, and, and we listen to it in a way we have never listened to sound. Mm. So you stage the body language in a very yes. precise 
beautiful. Yes. I mean, millimeter by millimeter, exactly and where the hands had to be, exactly how they would lean, how far he would come mm. down to the ice. So it's it's very very precisely staged. And 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 in terms of the framing of the shot, the composition, were you as precise yeah. yourself, or do you do you trust the eye of um, of uh, is it Peter? Or the Peter Zeitling, an Austrian, it's magnificent. Um, yeah. Yeah, I did the last but 14 you, films with him. Do you tell him exactly the composition you want, Not or do you always, want his no. composition? Not always. In, in case of how I was staging the, the three scientists who are listening, in that case I needed to, to balance the, the kind of frame myself in a way, but, but Peter is, is, is uh, strong like an oxen. He used to be a hockey player for Spartak Prague, Whoa. one of the best teams in Europe. <laughs> well, as a, as a young, very young kid, but uh, I, 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 I love the confidence in his physical strength and I love his feeling for rhythm. He stops me in the middle of shooting of something, let's say, um, Rescue Dawn, and he drop, takes down the camera and he says, Werner, uh, let's stop this, the scene has no rhythm. Hmm. And it's the first time a cinematographer sees that and tells me, and of course he was right. So you weren't enraged when he said that? He was so right. I, I immediately sensed, yes, there was something not working, and I said, Peter, what do we do? Uh, number one, the scene doesn't work because the dialogue <laughs> sounds like paper. It, it reads very well in the screenplay, but it sounds like paper. Let's have life in the dialogue. So takes me 30 seconds and I write a new dialogue. And he suggests, how about swinging in with the camera a little bit earlier so that I pick up this decisive moment and we do it again one and a half minutes later and it works. Fantastic. So I'm blessed with good, good people. So he, he But I discovered him in a way also. <laughs> in the in the, like Columbus discovered America. <laughs> yeah, well, I discovered him as uh, in, in a film that was really derided, an Austrian film by Ulrich Seidel, a very radical, very unusual filmmaker whom I like. And I, he got such bad reviews that I walked up into the best newspaper um, uh, building in uh, best newspaper in Austria, and I demanded that I write a review for the next film. Hmm. So I did it, and I write a, wrote a very good review. And, and at the end, I wrote the real discovery in this film is is a young cinematographer, Peter Zeitlinger. And Peter was so so stunned by it that he wrote me a letter and 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 said, uh, "I would love to work with you, maybe in five, maybe in ten years." Three weeks later, we were working together. Fantastic, <laughs> beautiful, and and uh, just so I understand it, so you're sometimes you're quite happy for to have his eye, of uh, course, uh, and and he's very comfortable if you say, "Here's, I want you to do exactly this way, Peter." Then he's perfectly happy with of that. Of course, as well. yes, that's beautiful. it's it's such a it's always if you if you do not understand how to collaborate, you will never get the real sense of movie making. In, in Rescue Dawn, something I wanted to ask you, and now picturing him back with you during yeah. that scene, it brought uh, a, a thought to mind. The, I was really intrigued. First of all, the, the, the captors in the camp were as terrifying to me as any Hannibal Lecter. Um, uh, and I don't know where you got these men, and I don't know how much, how much direction you lavished on them, but it was terrific the way with a minimum of dialogue. I, I can't remember if... if they had very yeah. little to say. Nevertheless, distinct personalities emerged. They weren't sort of the, the sort of yeah. stock stereotypical guys, and each, in their way, had different different things to be be afraid of, and and maybe different vulnerabilities. And mm -hmm. can you talk? What what could could? How did you how did you get it to be so good in that way? Well, I find the right people. That's uh, casting is is always such an important element, and. And somehow I, I, I find the right ones. Most of them actually were people who had been in films before, but not as actors, but as stuntmen. Mm. Some of them, and, and the one who did the somersaults forwards and backwards. And right. so I loved him so much for that, that I said, do it for the, in this scene. And, and, and I, 
uh, I took um, the best of him into the movie and the best of someone into the movie as well. And then by coincidence, I saw a video of a scene of a Thai movie. And there was one man in the background who had this very intense, intimidating look. And I said, we have to find this man. Turned out that he was not a Thai, but he lived in Cambodia. And we located him. And he only spoke uh, the, his own Cambodian language. He did not speak Thai, nor French, nor English, nor anything. And he was brought on, on the set, and he's acting in the film as the mute, as a, as a walk, no, they call him walkie-talkie uh -huh. because he never talk, because he never speaks, never, never. And, and walkie-talkie, <laughs> the man, uh, an, an actor whom uh, nobody knew, nobody could have any conversation with him, I, I directed him anyway, and we understood each other. There was actually one assistant, a Thai assistant, who spoke a few words uh, of, of Khmer, of the Cambodian mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. But um, it's fine to work um, into the unknown, into an area where, where you have to make everything that's beautiful and intense and special about a human being, how to make it productive for the screen. And sometimes uh, you have to do it without understanding the language and without mm -hmm. any communication, verbal communication. Or, for example, the native Indians in uh, Fitzcarraldo. Um, very few of them spoke Spanish. And all of them spoke either Ashininka, Kampa, or they spoke Machigenga. And, of course, you have to make yourself understood anyway. And that's the beauty about making movies. And they were the ones who understood my travails and tribulations with Kinski so instantly that they offered to kill him for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I regret that I didn't give them the nod. <laughs> um. Which reminds me about Aguirre and, and a question. Uh, Popol Vuh, who, who was credited with the score of, of a number of your films around yes. that period, I think. Um, is that the, because uh, uh, I know this, this, there are roots to this name anyway. Is that a band? Was it a, an, a, a band which was basically one person, Florian Fricke, who unfortunately died three years ago. Mm. Close friend of mine um, <clears throat> who was a prodigy as a, piano player and had to give up a very promising career because he had inflamed uh, ligaments and became a, a composer. And he named uh, his group, which was mostly him because he played many instruments parallel and recorded it on parallel tracks and a few other musicians. He named it after the sacred text of the Kachikele uh, Maya Indians, the Popol Vuh, the the book of um, uh, Buch des Gartes. Well, I don't, I can't mm -hmm. translate it right now. And, and it's one of the very, very beautiful and important texts for me, and I gave it to him to read it. Actually, Lotte Eisner reads, the great film historian, reads some of Popol Vuh as a, as a text for Fata Morgana, for oh, Mirage. Wonderful. Okay. So, and that's the context. Yeah. Uh, Popol Vuh comes uh, from this book, which was very important for me, and I kept reading and rereading it, gave it to him, and he named the group Popol Vuh. Hmm. And we had a very, very fine rapport about music, and he was very important for me. Then later on, after about 10 or 12 years of collaboration, we, we slowly drifted apart because he was moving very much into a pseudo-culture of new age, which I cannot stand at all. Um, I still loved him, but I, I, uh, I, I moved into some sort of a different direction. Mm -hmm. And the style of his music was more and more influenced by, uh, by, by uh, a, a babble of pseudo-philosophy. Um, and um, so that was the reason why mm -hmm. our collaboration drifted apart. Mm -hmm. we, we stayed friends f until he died. Mm. Werner, are you a musician? Do you play? No, I'm not. Uh, I can't even read music scores. Mm -hmm. 
but I do stage operas in one of my next works. Uh, well, I have to do a film in uh, New Orleans, and from there I have to scramble to Spain and do an opera, Parsifal, uh, the last Wagner mm. opera, together with Lorin Marcel. And where will this be? to have in, in Valencia in Spain. There's a fantastic uh, modern building which looks like a landed spacecraft by uh, a great architect, Calatrava, whom I kind of dislike because the stage uh, is, is very lousy. It's, it, can't, <laughs> it looks as a wonderful building, but you can't do much more like at La Scala Opera House uh, 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. You can push things from left and right and from back, and you can bring things down, and that's about it. But it's OK. I will live with it. The building is phenomenal. The music is extraordinary, and the conductor, one of the greatest alive. Can't get any better. When you direct but, uh, sorry, I wanted to say I, I was somehow disconnected from music because a music teacher, uh, when I was 13, forced me to sing in front of the whole mm. class, just wanting to break my back. And I disconnected myself from music like an artist. And then when school was over five years later, when I was 18, there was this enormous void and hunger for music. and. That's how I got, without any teaching and without anything, I immersed myself into music with a, a more, um, with a more ferocious uh, intensity than anyone else that I, I knew among my peers. Hmm. Um, the uh, the I, I, how did you deal with that moment um, when you were being forced to sing? Did you somehow? Well, everyone sang a song that was at that time that was this stupid uh, idea floating around that everybody had some music ta talent for music, or <laughs> talent for painting, which was kind of ridiculous. And and I stood up when 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 it came to me, I stood up and I said, I'm not going to sing. Mm -hmm. And then I became obstinate and I said to the teacher, you may do the somersault forwards and backwards, <laughs> but I'm not going to sing. So they called in the headmaster, and now they. They, they took the class hostage. These bastards took mm. the class hostage. I could strangle them today if I met them. <laughs> and, and from that moment on, I, I, I seriously planned to burn the, the school building <laughs> to the ground at night, which unfortunately I never did. <laughs> so, but uh, to this moment, uh, and, and I said to myself, never in my life anyone is going to break my back. It will not happen again. That is unique, rather dead than having your back broken again. Hmm. So that was very helpful. It was very helpful that, that I immersed myself all on my own into music in a way that was kind of strange. And I, I deal well with music, and I love to stage operas once in a while to work and breathe and uh, form music and, and images. It's wonderful, and uh, I can't read music scores, and I have to tell the conductors, are you, uh, are you ready to take the insult that the director of the opera cannot read the score, but I can listen mm. very well. Mm. I really listen well. Do you do you ever when you're directing an opera do you bring a camera with you to work no. at all? No. Never. It's such different worlds. Uh, uh, cinema and opera bite each other like cat and dog. <laughs> and, and no one, even the competent filmmakers, including Ingmar Bergman, never really succeeded to transform opera into a movie. Mm. It just doesn't. It just doesn't function for very fundamental. Uh, reasons uh, which we should not uh, go into, but uh, take my word. Yeah, we whoever probably would want to hear that. Who, yeah. who, whoever is going to try will fail, mm. because the, the the fundamental incompatibilities are so high that it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Let uh, opera should remain opera, and let movie remain movie. Bernie, you're in America. Your first films arrived. Um, more or less, I believe, at the same time as, as other films. And forgive me for saying from Germany yeah. and not saying from Bavaria, but um, uh, you know, and I think there was a sense that you know, the great exciting thing that had happened in world cinema was the, the new German films and, and this remarkable 
what appeared to be synchronicity of suddenly here films like Werner Herzog and the Fassbinder films and and Dim Wenders and Von Trotta yeah. and all this the, the best films seem now suddenly to be coming from Germany. So there was a, a I think there was probably some branding that you were you were probably branded by being part of the new German cinema or something yeah. like that. Did you feel in any way any kind of affinity, even though there was no stylistic similarities with mm -hmm. these other directors? And and did you feel that? That that uh, it was that you didn't like being being labeled as part of a movement. Well, I, I was labeled, and you can't do anything against it. So I, I let it I let it pass as it was. But what was significant, and what I understood, is there was a real renaissance of of German cinema, and we were not accepted immediately. It took many years until because um, there was. Um, a very understandable reluctance to accept German culture again. Hmm. Germany has lapsed, had lapsed into the utmost, deepest abyss of barbarism in the Third Reich during the Nazi time. And all of a sudden, a new generation that grew up after the Nazi regime. We were old enough in the late 60s, mid 60s, late 60s to articulate ourselves. And a man like Fritz Lang um, uh, could not believe that ever German cinema would emerge again. Lotte Eisner sent him a letter and he, she said, I saw Signs of Life, that was the first film that was shown here in New York, mm. for example. Mm. He, she said to him, there's, there's, a, there's a film you must see, it's called Signs of Life by a young man. And Fritz Lang wrote back, Lotte, it is not possible that there will be ever any decent movies out of Germany. Hmm. And, um, and that was somehow the, 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 the mood of, of the time. And it was more a, a question of perseverance, of continuing making films and, and, and uh, bringing them to audiences. And, and within um, uh, seven, eight, ten years, um, the audiences here in America and in other countries started to, to accept us. Mm. Did, during that period of time where you were sort of branded and faced with the same kind of hurdle to overcome, did, did you become well acquainted with, with Fassbinder and vendors and people like that? or Not very well acquainted, but uh, Fassbinder uh, liked me a lot and I liked him. And for example, when I went out to pre-production of Agiri, The Wrath of God, I said to myself, I'm not going to go to a country like Peru and I'm not going to show up with empty hands. I brought eight films with me, mm. some of my own stuff, three films by Fassbinder. Mm. He didn't even know that. I grabbed some of his prints mm. uh, and, and, and showed it, showed wow. it to students in, in Peru and, and he learned about it. And when he met me a year later or so, he, he just, we didn't know how to deal with each other. Mm -hmm. There was always a... Uh, a, 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 a menacing group of uh, leather-clad uh, consorts of his <laughs> who, were, who were suspicious about me because Fassbinder would grab me and hug me. And, and we had these kind of strange fleeting hugs. <laughs> and, but but we, we, kind, we, we really liked each other and we really respected each other as different as we were in lifestyle, in... Uh, movie making in, in everything. Um, Wenders, yes, I, I always liked his films. Not all of them, but most of them. Same thing with Fassbinder. Sometimes I lost confidence and I thought three films sloppily made in a row and all of a sudden he comes with a, with a sensational movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just staggering and it took him three months to make three, four movies. Mm. Yeah. Um, Schlondorf has been a great defender of mine. He's a, he's a, a very dear friend of mine, uh, a personal friend. We hardly ever talk about cinema. Uh, we speak to each other when, when we uh, are in sorrow, uh, when things do not go right in life, then, then we call each other and try to meet. Did Schlendorf arrive a little, little, or maybe years uh, before you guys did with first films, but then get energized by, by what, what, uh, no, what you were doing? No, not really. Well, I made films uh, before Schlendorf. Oh, I did. mean, featurettes mm -hmm. back in 1961, 62. 
He came out with his first feature film, I believe, in 1966, mm -hmm. The Young Turles. Yeah. And I made my first uh, feature film, long feature film, a year later, oh. in 67. So we, we, although he's older than me, but we, we came out with our first films almost at the same time. And he's, um, he's a very, uh, uh, very dear friend of mine. And under uh, most vicious attack, uh, I, I was labeled as, uh, as a, a criminal who had put native Indians into prison. And so there was a lot of, of wild things going on in the world press. And, and, and he stood up and, and I thought the, the man was going to die from a stroke because he was purple in his face and yelled at this bunch of, of, of journalists. Um, and, mm. and I do not forget things like that. Mm. Werner, are you, are you familiar with uh, YouTube? Uh, yeah, not really, but I, I have eventually seen a little bit, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe four or five uh, things at YouTube. Are you, are you on the computer? Do you have a... I, I use a computer, but mostly for, for communicating with my brother in, uh, in uh, Munich, and we are nine hours apart because I live in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So email is very good, uh, writing a screenplay and sending it to a friend in Boston and asking him for uh, corrections in my English grammar. Mm -hmm. I know it's lousy, but um, I need corrections, and he sends it back to me half a day later. So, But I'm not very much into... Uh, into YouTube and things like that. I, Although I, it's a wonderful instrument and what, what we saw, the presentation of yes. the website is absolutely formid formidable because all of a sudden the, the web uh, gains significant depth. Mm -hmm. You see, it was so shallow. Much of it is so shallow and so um, half informed and so and all of a sudden um, about movies, you, you, you just access this website and you will find, you can branch out and mm -hmm. you can go in very deep, uh, to, to, to deep bottoms of, of the unknown in cinema. Mm -hmm. So I salute the website. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. The, the, uh, I asked you about YouTube because I sort of, I haven't thought this through, but, but for the past several weeks, um, I found myself feeling that, that the most ex exciting thing going on in American cinema um, now is happening on YouTube, that, that uh, with, with such a this tremendous proliferation of cameras and, and with pe young people especially know how to edit on their computer now, and then they can whoosh, get it to YouTube. And um, I think, I think the, the, the exciting new directors are probably um, uh, doing stuff for YouTube mm -hmm. and for this sort of limitless um, uh, audience. There was a, an article, um, a column by Frank Rich uh, a mm -hmm. month or two ago where he talked about, uh, he came out with some t statistics about how he, he referenced, the, for example, um, Obama's speech on race and how a certain amount of people saw it broadcast live. and. 20 times that, or, or I, yeah. I don't re remember the multiples, so have seen it on YouTube. Yeah. And, and the, the idea, on the one hand, of YouTube being a, a, um, a medium for, for ideas being exchanged. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's lots of short videos, and now you'll see more and more excerpts from speeches. Sometimes yeah. that can be used very... But you can see entire speeches. My wife, for example, watches... Uh, uh, on YouTube, uh, over the internet, <clears throat> a great discourse, for example, between political analysts, or she would see the entire speech of Obama, or mm -hmm. she would see, and, and I have to catch up with it, because there's something of great significance occurring right now. And uh, I do not want to exclude myself, although I, I probably will not produce films for YouTube. Um, <laughs> And, and sometimes the odd things about me end up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So you, you see some, some uh, very fancy little moments. And, uh, and somehow it's too, too selective and too exclusive to, right. to give an idea about a person. Um, so it has its disadvantages, but it will settle in. It will settle in and, and we'll have... Uh, uh, probably a, a, a great forum for, for watching things 
as long as they are connected to a very tiny screen. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's not really my, my kind of thing. I'd like to see a film on a larger screen. Well, it's intriguing. We can now see what's on a computer uh, transmitted to the large yes. screen. And there's, there's some, um, uh, and enough of YouTube, but I do want to say there's, there are, I think, thrilling. Uh, I've seen a couple of things, and I haven't really looked all over the place. I've been lucky enough to have some things sent to me. Yeah. And I know some very young filmmakers who went out and blasted out some very bold, very, very excellent yeah. short films, and they wind up there. And there's, there's people like, uh, there's a guy named uh, Dan Deacon. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there anyone who knows about Dan Deacon? Yes, look. Yeah. Um, and if, if you type his name and you just see all this fabulous yeah. new cinema, it's three minutes long or something, yeah. but, but these That's a little bit of disadvantage. It has such short breath only. And, and uh, I like to tell a whole story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, but <laughs> of course, uh, there, there is a validity in, in, in having short clips and, and doing something in three minutes. Why not? Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I believe that YouTube or other forms of, of the internet will allow us to view a, a whole three-hour movie and somehow connect it to, at home to a large flat screen and inviting a few friends and, and you have something which will um, eventually create a, a different culture of viewing films. And it's most exciting to see how how many people there are out there. Yeah. It's just, it's just totally wild. Okay, um, Jonathan, uh, I knew, Jonathan asked me to come up when we had to stop because I knew he was going to get uh, wrapped up in this conversation. Um, I, all I want to say is I hope you all know that you're invited to a reception that we're doing right outside to celebrate both Moving Image Source and you two amazing people.